Welcome everyone to this new uh, robustly beneficial uh, discussion. Uh, today we will discuss the topic of uh, security and privacy applied to machine learning. Uh, we will uh, specifically discuss of, uh, the points in, uh, raised in uh, one paper from uh, Nicolas Paperno, Paperno uh, from uh, Google Brain. Uh, the first thing that I found interesting in that paper is the, the link he makes with a uh, good outlaw and uh, uh, you must already have heard it that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And uh, for machine learning model, we have the same problem that when a model becomes a target, it ceases to be, it starts to be vulnerable. And uh, the, the the reason why is that even though you have run some tests that says your model is uh, robustly beneficial 99% of the time. Uh, this 1% that's left, it will be a door open to, to attacks. And if this model that you have deployed is a target, uh, then the attackers will use this 1%. And the result of this is that your model will actually not fail just 1% of the time, but a higher percentage. Yeah, I think it's one of the big challenges of uh, designing uh, uh, machine learning algorithms or algorithms in general. Uh, that are deployed and used by billions of users is that if it's used by billions of users, then there's probably a, a lot of incentives to try to exploit it. And uh, there's a huge amount of incentives from billions of users to uh, exploit the vulnerabilities of one algorithm, then you can definitely expect uh, people to try to, to hack these vulnerabilities and essentially your, your system to be uh, completely uh, uh, open and completely cracked because of, of these vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. In the rest of the paper, the the discussion I, I find is very interesting. It uh, it describes uh, principles that are useful for a computer system in general, but not uh, not systems that do machine learning, and then uh, try to make connections with a system doing machine learning. So. Uh, and and there are there are a lot of differences. For example, uh, uh, sex security for systems that do machine learning can be interesting to look at at training time, but also at testing time. So there there, there are these two types of attacks. Also, discussing the the privacy is very important about machine learning, and uh, and there, there there is also the fact that you should look at the whole system of the the deploy machine learning algorithms from the training from how the algorithms is queried from the input data that we give to the algorithms for each query. And, uh, and uh, it's interesting to discuss how these principles that are, uh, that, be, that were designed simply for normal computer systems can give us very interesting insights about uh, machine learning uh, models. Yeah, these are topics very uh, not specific to uh, to machine I'm learning. Machine learning. Yeah. yeah, there's a huge amount of uh, of work already be done in trying to make systems more more secure, more robust, uh, and have better guarantees uh, for some term, in terms of uh, of privacy. Um, and definitely, like machine learning has to take a lot of this into account because for a long time, like uh, there was a, the challenges of machine learning was just to show that you can have a system that works. And now we have system that works, but now we have to make sure that our systems will always work, which is a, a, a huge difference. There's a huge difference between working in average or in a, in a basic setting and actually working once deployed in practice in complex environments with potentially a huge number of, of uh, malicious users. And to, 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 to do so, to, to, to bridge this gap between working in some setting and working all the time, uh, it's actually, it takes a lot of, uh, of, uh, a lot of work and making a lot of thinking and, uh, and many of the ideas uh, for classical algorithms are definitely relevant for, for machine learning algorithms as well. Yeah, what you, so what you describe is a, is a sometimes called a distributional uh, shift. The fact that uh, one assumption of machine learning is that the testing distribution is going to be similar to the training distribution. 
But what happened in practice is that the testing distribution is uh, very different from the training distribution because, uh, as we said, have actors that try to game the system and, uh, and, and create these differences. Yeah. Um, one other thing he, the, the paper discusses a bit, um, and uh, I would like to hear your opinion on it, is the uh, auditing ML. Like, uh, the, um, there are many people who, who think we should have auditing or uh, audit protocols or, or, or um, ways to audit machine learning. And uh, it's not very clear uh, from, the, from the section how this audit could be done in a reliable way. I don't know what's your take on that. Yeah, so the, the solution that he was proposing discussing in this paper are some of them I found quite interesting. So the first one, it happens at the, so for example, uh, he also mentioned the concept of uh, differential privacy. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we can audit mm -hmm. from, the, from the training data. We, can, uh, we could have uh, algorithms that are verified and uh, we know for sure that part of the information that was in the training data set mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is, is not actually part of the model. So this, uh, this would be a, a, a proof, I think, that the differential privacy uh, was correctly applied by best one algorithms. Uh, a, second, uh, uh -huh. a second interesting thing is that, so because it's a machine learning system, as I said, that we can, uh, there are things happening at a training time and possible attacks at that time, and also things happening at the testing time. And uh, a second uh, possibility of uh, audit would be simply look at what are the queries being done at a uh, testing time. And for example, if you see that uh, during testing, some query is very similar to some input data you had in, uh, in the training data set, it's likely some attackers that is trying to, to learn the data that, that you have been trained on. Uh, an example of this is, for, for example, uh, YouTube is giving me recommendations and these are somehow private. I would not want that the recommendation that YouTube is giving me would be known by, uh, by a lot of others. So if, if it was possible for someone to, to somehow fake someone very similar to me, some very similar patterns to mine and then knows what YouTube wow. would recommend. So that means that that would be a kind of attack that happened at testing time. Someone trying to, to, to get my private data, the recommendation that are done uh, privately for me. And, uh, and this, uh, this kind of auditing, it would happen by somehow keeping logs of uh, what queries are, are being done on the, on, the on the recommend system, on the machine learning system. And, uh, and somehow what one thing we could test is, does it di diverge too much from uh, what we expected? like uh, based on the assumption that uh, the, the training distribution would be similar to the testing distribution. Yeah, I think a lot of this is related to uh, things that we have already discussed in the past, like the, the black box uh, abstraction mm -hmm. of, of machine learning. Um, yeah, well, I think one difficulty of, of, uh, of machine learning, but actually it's not specific to machine learning. You can think of any, uh, source code that's not open, uh, and even if it's open and poorly written, I'd say, uh, like sometimes the best way to know about uh, the algorithm is just to have uh, all sorts of testing through interactions with the system, like you're giving it input and seeing what the, the output is. Uh, and yeah, and so, so, so this can be very hard to, to, to analyze. Uh, having said that, in the specific case of, uh, for instance, neural networks or some of these machine learning algorithms, they're not actually really uh, fully transparent, uh, fully uh, opaque. Uh, they, they, like you could share, for instance, the, the weights of the, uh, for the, like the parameters of, of the, the machine learning algorithm. And sometimes based on this, you can do some analysis or there are some, some, some approaches based on uh, ideas from uh, formal verifications. Uh, for instance, you can try to prove that whenever you have an input that has this property, then the output always has these desirable properties, something like this. So, so th these are, are ways to go. 
as well, but uh, it's not always clear how they scale up to, to larger neural networks. Mm. Yeah. Uh, perhaps another thing we can dis discuss, I think an idea uh, that uh, comes very early on in the paper is the idea that um, uh, when you're designing a system and you're trying to make it secure, mm -hmm you're trying to make it secure against adversaries. And uh, it's not necessarily the right model to assume that the adversary is uh, omnipotent and all powerful mm -hmm. uh, and omniscient. Uh, so omnipotent is that he can do anything. Omniscient is that he can know everything. Because in practice, this is not the case. And it may be more realistic to assume that he has some budget, some some you know, amount of power and he can use it in different ways but he cannot do anything with this uh, with this power and then you're trying to be robust to this kind of adversary uh, and sometimes this makes this allows you to do a lot more because a uh, all powerful uh, adversary like it's very hard to fight against but if you only say that you have to be resilient to a very powerful but not all powerful adversary uh, then maybe then you can to have uh, efficient algorithms, scalable algorithms that uh, do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, th this is not uncommon in uh, the research on the more maybe on the robustness side uh, of machine learning. Yeah, uh, this is definitely uh, what, what what I find interesting is that it's an idea that would come up naturally for machine learning because machine learning you cannot have uh, formal methods, mm -hmm. but even if you use formal methods, at some point you're still going to have to make assumptions mm -hmm. uh, because if you really think about the security of a formal algorithm uh, mm -hmm. with lots of proofs, uh, well, the security of all of this depends on every component of this. And if uh, it's a combination actually of 10 algorithms and the 10 algorithms are communicating in all possible ways, uh, so there are like many combinations of uh, of all of them, then, then the, the combinator X starts to explode and uh, it can be very hard to keep track of all of the dependencies of all the, and uh, it, yeah. In addition to this, you can even have uh, more sophistic sophisticated attacks like uh, side channels or, or things like this, uh, or you're hacking some parts of the system that are easier to hack, uh, especially if like, it's a multi-component uh, system. Mm -hmm. And uh, even for formal methods, you need, to, to, you cannot assume to be robust to everything because it's too hard, but you have to be a, a robust to a huge amount of attacks. And this actually turns out to be what is done in machine learning because in the end you cannot hope for, for much better in machine learning. Okay, so just maybe to, uh, to talk about some research I'm familiar with actually the, some of the research we did. Uh, yeah. So for example, in the context of Byzantine uh, resilience, so where you want to be resilient against an omniscient but not omnipotent adversary, you can still have subclasses of omniscience uh, based on the computing power of the, of the adversary. For example, an adversary that could look at all the gradients of everyone uh, at uh, infinitely short time, so with infinite computing power, would be the, would be the full Byzantine uh, adversary, but you can, you can have more realistic uh, assumptions. For example, whether the adversary could uh, spy on the sp spy on the gradients of everyone and um, do some computations on these gradients to, to compute the best attack. But to do that, uh, the adversary, so she or he, may need um, a big O, so uh, an, an order of uh, the dimensions, uh, computing time for each update epoch. And since the update can be very short, so they need to perform a, a big O D. So D is the dimension of the model computation within the time that it requires for the model to be updated. So that's, that's very constraining. And uh, so with this constraint, for example, you can, uh, you can, you can downgrade or upgrade uh, uh, the requirements on uh, uh, the, the robustness required because if you know that you will update the model very fast, you won't be waiting for 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 late updates. Uh, so then the adversary would not have time enough time to, for example, do some uh, 
regression on the gradients and find uh, maybe what is the best attack, etc., to to poison you. So yeah, they're, they're already they're already uh, they, they, what what you suggest is already uh, there at least for the past two years in in the field of uh, Byzantine uh, fault tolerance for machine learning. Yeah, but maybe you can push it uh, to other directions. So one thing we we discussed uh, uh, was about um, mm -hmm. social medias. So for instance, mm -hmm. on social medias, you want uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to be resilient to Russian trolls, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or like yeah these are fake accounts that are just trying to manipulate uh, the the public opinion uh, for instance to undermine another country or, or things like this you, you want to be resilient to this mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one thing you could say well we need to be resilient to all our users but this is actually probably impossible to do unless you shut down every account which is not uh, something that sounds desirable uh, but instead of that, maybe you can have models where you assume that the, the, the adversary, the, the troll adversary, mm -hmm. has the power to hack a certain number of accounts. Uh, but And maybe some accounts are easier to hack in a sense than others. Um, probably if it's uh, uh, the, the Twitter account of some uh, very famous person, it's going to be harder to, 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 for, for trolls to take control of it. But if it's all accounts of people who have been using Twitter for a long time, but have not been using lately, then maybe it's easier to, to hack. And using this assumption of the amount of power of the adversary of uh, here, the trolls, then maybe you can come up with algorithms that are robust to this kind of, of, of power. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so maybe that's a research direction that, that could be uh, extremely relevant, uh, especially to to the current situation uh, of COVID-19 where there's a lot of uh, misinformation. Agree? Something to add on, on that or? Yeah, so maybe some, uh, something uh, we, uh, that we discussed very quickly and uh, we could say more about it is the, the openness of the, of the code. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's something that mm -hmm. maybe we didn't discuss uh, when we talked about uh, black boxes previously. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, it, 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 it's a very common principle in a security system that if your code is open source, uh, it's it's much more trustful to, that the code is a uh, is, is actually secure, because uh, and uh, the reason to believe in this is that if a lot of people have had the possibility to to find the failures in the code uh, because of the open source uh, situation, then. Uh, that indicates that if you do not find a, a bug or a possible hack, then the code is trustworthy. And for machine learning, actually opening the, the source code is only a small part of the of what can be opened. So uh, other question, uh, other things that could be open is the, the input data, the parameters of the model, uh, what prediction are being done in, uh, in which situations. And, uh, and all of these relate to, to question of uh, security and, uh, and a question of privacy. So clearly, uh, so it, it, in the discussion we had, it seemed to be quite obvious that people wanted the, the, the code of uh, this, this, uh, this software to be, to be more open. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, one of the main reasons for me to see that this code should stay closed is that it gives more more, a more difficult time for attacker to to actually uh, generate attacks. Uh, one uh, one way to see this is about, uh, for example, uh, in the case of neural network, uh, generating adversarial examples. I believe it's uh, much easier to do it if you have access to the parameters of the model compared to if you don't have access to the parameters of the model. And so I think the most the the recommended system that matters the most today they are they are very closed and it's even some, uh, some small things like uh, receiving uh, the output of the, of the algorithms is something that's uh, very difficult. I think uh, it's, I don't think it's possible for example to, to query a YouTube recommender system more than 1 million times per hour for, with, uh, for an individual. So, so somehow uh, we had this debate whether this uh, this whether openness is desirable 
or we or whether it will uh, give more keys to attackers to to manipulate the system yeah. we discussed at some point uh, the, like for instance would you want your spam filter to be open source well, yeah. uh, i don't remember how we settled on, on this like so uh, yeah and again spam filter to be open source i i'd be very happy if the algorithms of the spam filter is open source, but not the training data it has been trained on. Yeah. Yeah. Because clearly if the if the whole algorithm with training data or if the simply the parameters of the algorithms are open source, it means that someone wanting to send spam could simply run locally the spam filter, know whether the spam will be stopped or not, and and change its uh, its its spam email to 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 find the failure of the spam filter. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and as you say, if you know the parameters of the, if it's neural networks and you know the parameters, then you can compute the, the gradient. And this tells you how much, you, what, what is critical in the message, for instance, you've written that uh, pushed uh, to the, towards the definition, uh, the decision of, um, of filtering out or not uh, the message you sent. And so you can more quickly uh, change your, your 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 emails so that they, they get through the, the the spam filter, uh, and so it it seems that if you want a, a well a fully open source uh, uh, by fully open I mean you have access to all the data and all the parameters mm -hmm. of the of a spam filter seems like a very bad idea. So is it an impossible impossible thing to have? Well, you can. Yeah, like you mean efficient, and uh, like, would it still be efficient? Uh, yeah, are you asking? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing not, but uh, yeah, if you have the parameters, uh, or, if, or if you can run it uh, locally, I think there's there's huge incentives to to be for our, for for passing uh, spam filters. So yeah, maybe you don't want uh, your spam filters to be uh, open source. Um, for security reasons, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So that's why it was quite interesting to to see this discussion of uh, of principles that are uh, very obvious for normal computer system, but that became become slightly strange when we talk about uh, machine learning systems. Yeah, I, I guess if it was a uh, the spam filter was a hundred percent good in a sense. Uh, it's, if it does exactly what person wants and, and doesn't want, then it would be it would be fine. But uh, like it doesn't sound reasonable in practice. Like uh, that's this game, and and there seems to be a gain in uh, uh, obscuring the algorithm. Yeah, and maybe it also goes back to the to some discussion we we had. Uh, about uh, social media manipulation that uh, in the end certainly that the attackers would become uh, extremely good at uh, imitating uh, normal humans and then it then uh, if uh, if someone creating spam is extremely good at imitating uh, a normal email any spam filter would would uh, would fail actually to detect this kind of uh, of spam so uh, in this case what was my conclusion is that uh, so because we can't detect uh, what is a, a authentic authentic message compared to what is a message with the intent of manipulation uh, the what what we truly desire that the system would do is actually push forward messages that are beneficial and uh, and and lower the impact of messages that are not no matter what no matter the source of these messages so yeah yeah, and, and the problem is, is really, I think, it has to do with good heart flow, I guess, and with, uh, um, yeah, if you have a system that you, that you know exactly, wh whose no rules are exactly known, then you can better exploit the system if it's not perfectly aligned. And you sh I think we should absolutely assume that uh, the systems we design are not perfectly aligned. And uh, because of this, it's a vulnerability that may be best uh, yeah, protected by uh, not being fully open. Oh yeah, it, it goes uh, back to this idea from uh, Stuart Russell that I found uh, quite interesting. 
that uh, to somehow beat a good outlaw, to not not reveal the the, the full uh, objective function to the to the artificial intelligence system, but uh, somehow let the artificial intelligence system have an uncertainty about what is the objective function, and uh, and this way uh, the what the what the artificial intelligence will try to do is to to guess what you really want and to to, to work on this. And uh, yeah, it, it, it mentioned this idea in the context of uh, interruptibility because uh, yeah, this is a an instrumental goal to to not be interrupted for for machine learning system. And and uh, but if if the machine learning system has uncertainty about its own objective function. We can expect that if he sees that there's a tentative of uh, interruption, he might uh, deduce that oh, it's because I'm not doing the right thing, so it's actually in my interest to let myself be interrupted. Yeah, yeah. So you're playing this in the opposite way. Uh, you replace the human by the machine and the machine by the human. Uh, but yeah, if you, yeah, we're all trying to hack one another. Uh, algorithms or humans. <laughs> And uh, you don't want algorithms to hack humans, but you also don't want humans to hack algorithms. <laughs> yeah, so we also discussed the fact that maybe some parts of the codes of, of, of YouTube can, uh, maybe should be uh, opened. Uh, like, uh, uh, I think it's complicated, but uh, I would push for more openness and at least collaborations with uh, people outside from YouTube, for, uh, like academics, for instance. And public but, uh, health authorities and uh, yeah public health authorities uh, especially these days it's uh -huh. extremely valuable uh -huh. but uh, i think in many countries it could lead to to backlashes uh, especially in france uh but yeah like th these are extremely valuable information that they have and if they can be exploited for good that uh, that that'd be that'd be good uh but it's not easy either to make your code uh, open um uh, and like we, we discussed uh, like tr like the information systems of companies today mm -hmm. is quite often a huge part of their whole business. Like if you remove the information system of, well, the, the worst case, probably a bank, then there's nearly nothing left. Uh, like the, the information system of a bank is, is critical. And, but it, this also holds like for uh, the airplane industry. Like uh, if you remove the, uh, algorithmic part of an airplane, then essentially the airplane does not fly anymore. Uh, not only the algorithmic part of the airplane, uh, the like the plane itself, but if you take a, a, f a flight company, yeah, uh, I've read that for example Air France, uh, the assets. Uh, so if you evaluate the assets of Air France, the the software that runs the booking, the booking software Amadeus, which is a a sub, I think it's a sub company of Air France now. It's worth more than the total cost of uh, for buying all the all the planes that Air France owns. Yeah. So the soft the the worth the worth of the if, if you value the assets of Air France, uh, it has more assets in software uh, for for the booking software in the booking software uh, than assets in the form of planes. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, even the planes, <laughs> they're and, still, and I think, the like planes, a third yes, of, uh, of course, the cost sir. of the plane, something like this, is of the course, software. So if you, if you just take the assets in terms of software, then you get a higher value. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, so far it's extremely important, but changing the software, it also means that changing the software is a big deal for a company. Like it's worth a lot of money to have a good software. And uh, we gave the example, uh, which is actually relevant these days of COBOL. Uh, do you want to tell? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, re recently the, the governor of New Jersey was, uh, was looking for, uh, so in the middle, in the, uh, during this mess created by the coronavirus, uh, the governor of, Jersey, of New Jersey were, were seeking the help of COBOL developers because the, the unemployment platform uh, crashed due to the surge of, of people trying to register in it. And it has legacy code written in COBOL, which is now 60 years old, 70 years old. No, 60. Yeah. It was written in the it was written in the 50s, 60-ish years old. And so in the book we wrote with Lay, 
uh, where we're in, in a place in a moment where we discuss the problems in having interruptible systems. Uh, we illustrate the fact uh, the, the, the the fact that sometimes it's very costly to 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 just interrupt something that is running uh, by the example of COBOL. So be, before COVID, uh, the legacy the, there was there were known cases of banks trying to get rid of the legacy code written in COBOL. And for example, the Austra the Australian Commonwealth Bank spent three quarters of billion dollars, so 70, 70, 150, 750 million dollars. Uh, uh, so it lost all that amount of money uh, during uh, the, the replace of for, for the sake of replacing the legacy code that is written in COBOL. So that's, that is an argument for not changing, uh, for, for not interrupting the system, because if you interrupt it, the cost would be high. Yeah, and so if you a company, a big, a big company wants to make uh, uh, much of its code uh, open, even half of its code uh, open, mm. Then it's probably a multi. Uh, if it's a big wow. company like Google, it's probably a multi-billion business uh, uh, project, wow. and it's not even sure that it's going to succeed. Like it's, it's like really, really a big deal. Uh, I think there should be efforts in this direction, but I think we have to factor in what we are asking from 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 these companies, and wow. you have to show that there's a, a gain in this uh, either through regulations or, or through uh, uh, gain of trust or, or whatever. But if, if there's not this gain, I don't think we can expect this company to, to like out of their goodness, uh, say, uh, we're going to make the codes uh, more open. Um, so, so I'd say like, if you're advocating for more openness of this company, I think it's a good idea to first really think about the incentive structures and what can be done. Yeah. And maybe ask something that's more reasonable about, uh, that's more likely to lead to something good. Uh, should we wrap up or something missing? I think we covered all the topics we discussed in the reading group. Maybe, right? yes. Anything else that we discussed uh, and that may be uh, important is uh, essentially there are two ways and usually they are more or less combined uh, to, to, to to guarantee a greater security and privacy uh, in systems. Uh, the first approach is more uh, empirical, is more uh, you set up a system and you try to, to attack it. And if you cannot attack it, you let others try to attack it. And if others cannot attack it, then you say, well, it's likely to be uh, secure. Uh, but it's nowhere near guaranteed. Maybe there's a new trick that someone will find and that can completely break the system. So it has its limits. Uh, and the other approach is uh, theoretical. Uh, so for instance, for differential privacy, there's this uh, concept of uh, uh, no, differential privacy, which is a formal concept. And this means that you can actually use mathematics to guarantee ahead of time Mm -hmm. that your algorithm will have a lot of desirable properties. Uh, for, sec uh, for security, you have also uh, all sorts of uh, such systems, for instance, uh, formal verification methods, uh, Byzantine resilience, uh, like, uh, guarantees in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, performance guarantees or, or yeah, resilience to, to this or this uh, uh, variations in the data uh, distribution shifts and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to combine the two, but if you want to do uh, theoretical work uh, for security or privacy, it's first important to have a good model, a good definition of what you mean by security and privacy. And this can be actually uh, extremely difficult. Uh, for privacy, essentially, well, there are dif different definitions, but the, the leading definition is differential privacy, and it's a nice uh, definition. Mm -hmm. But it's also uh, arguably too restrictive in many settings. Uh, so it's very, very hard to, to apply. Also, like it blows up very quickly. So if you have a, uh, yeah, there's this parameter called epsilon, but if you have a, a one, a, a epsilon equal one differential privacy, then it's good. But if you have epsilon equals 10 a differential privacy, then it's uh, essentially useless as a, as a guarantee. Uh, so, yeah, making all of these work together is, a, is, a, is, is very complicated and is, is very hard, but it needs to be done too. 
Okay. And there's uh, also what? yes. But there, and there's also a, a huge pedagogical challenge uh, because a lot of people are talking about privacy, but uh, like uh, I'm doubting that a lot fraction, uh, a large fraction of people who are talking about privacy know about differential privacy, for instance, uh, about the formal definition and the intuition. And I think even fewer of them are able to explain it to, to some, someone else uh, in an understandable manner. Uh, and I don't think I can explain it to most people, uh, differential privacy, unless I have like uh, two hours of their time in, and they're very focused. Uh, so, yeah, in all of this, uh, even security and stuff like this, and uh, it's related also to the COVID situation, to all sorts of, of problems. Uh, pedagogy, I think, is underrated and is uh, really, really important. And um, yes, so, um, uh, and then, yeah, with, uh, with, uh, with pedagogy, I think we can conclude and uh, it is a bit the topic of next week. So next week, we will discuss the question of uh, contact tracing and the challenges uh, for contact tracing in terms of privacy and trust. Uh, contact tracing has emerged uh, now as um, one of the most promising solutions to get us out of confinement due to COVID. So next week, we'll discuss the, um, the question of contact tracing and uh, some of the proposed solutions uh, by people from EPFL, among others. Uh, and the trust and privacy challenges they raise, and, and how to be pedagogical on these two fronts to ensure that these solutions would work and would be adopted by a large fraction of the population. So thank you very much, and see you next week. Bye. Bye.